Good morning. Let's begin. I am David Marcos, the program manager for the Arabo Molecular Information Storage Program, or MIS. I want to thank you all for coming. Many of you have come from quite far flung places, and we're very grateful uh, for your time on your very busy schedules to come and participate in this event today. Um, it's particularly gratifying for me. I've been uh, working with a number of you uh, on community building activities around this effort for the better part of the last two years. So it's really exciting uh, to see the, the representation that we have in the room here today. Uh, we have a, a great mix of large um, industry uh, players from the semiconductor and um, storage device industries. So we have representatives from Intel, Micron, Seagate, Western Digital. We have, I think, 12 startup companies. We have um, a lot of academic and industrial research laboratories and even some venture capital uh, staff floating around. So given that one important goal of this event is um, to, to facilitate teaming activities and help people to build the, uh, the teams that they need to uh, to contribute to this program, I think we have just the perfect mix here today. So um, thank you all very much for your participation. Um, so for the next couple of minutes, I will be um, introducing uh, some of the, the logistics uh, of, uh, of the events. First of all, some of the most important things, the bathrooms are just out the door to the left, and then you make a hard right at the stairs. Uh, there's a coffee shop in the lobby. Um, Lunch will be at 12. The government will not be providing you with lunch, but in your packets there is a list of uh, a number of local restaurants where you can uh, go and feed yourselves. Let's see. All right, a couple of important disclaimers at the outset. Um, this presentation is solely for information and planning purposes. It is not a formal solicitation for proposals or abstracts. Um, we will be releasing a draft technical portion of the program solicitation, hopefully uh, by tomorrow. And uh, I'll endeavor to uh, send out a notification to everyone who's registered for this event so you can review that and you can see uh, in detail what the current program design looks like. And that's a great opportunity to provide feedback to the government about what you think should be changed and there is a formal mechanism for providing that written feedback uh, that will be included with, with that draft BAA. Um, nothing said here today changes the requirements that will be set forth in a BAA, and the BAA supersedes anything that's presented or said by IARPA at Proposers Day. So we are in the process now of socializing ideas for what the program design will look like. This is this event, and um, the, the feedback you provide both here today and on the draft BAA that we're going to release, this is your opportunity to influence uh, how the program is designed and executed. So please, please seize that opportunity. So the goal for this event, first and foremost, are to familiarize all of you with IARPA's interest in the Molecular Information Storage Program. Please ask questions and provide feedback. You should all have note cards in your packets. Um, as questions occur to you over the course of this morning's government presentations, please write them down. Um, Bernardo, I think, will be collecting them. Um, do you want to just uh, stand up and make yourself known, Bernardo? Please provide your note cards to him. And during the late morning session, I think starting at 1120, uh, we'll do a fireside chat where I read through your questions and, um, and answer them to the best of my ability. Um, the other key goal of this event is to foster discussion of complementary capabilities among potential program participants, also known as teaming. Many of you have superlative capabilities in one or more areas that are going to be vital to the success of this program. Polymer synthesis capabilities, maybe you have a novel chemistry, but maybe you don't have um, device development experience. There are people in the room who do. Um, please endeavor to meet them because as we will see during the, the technical portion of uh, today's uh, government presentation, the success in each technical area of this program is gonna require multidisciplinary expertise. So um, 
really seize the opportunity. I mean, you all made the trip to come here today. Please do your best to meet everyone. The, the organization, well, I'll talk about the agenda. We're going to have opportunities for you to be made aware of other people's capabilities um, in the afternoon session. All right, I've already mentioned that um, you should record your questions on note cards. Once the BAA is released, um, there is a, a formal way that we have to go about answering your questions. You have to submit them in writing to the program email address. We collect them and answer them in, in tranches uh, with responses that are going to be posted on the program website. And there is sometimes a delay of you know a few days to a week to doing that. So right now is the opportunity to uh, get a rapid feedback on your questions. All right, this is the agenda for today. Um, we are talking currently about um, the goals for the Proposers Day and some of the logistics for the event. Uh, after I shut up, uh, Bill Vanderland, our chief scientist, will be giving an overview of IARPA, uh, who we are, what our goals are, and um, how we approach research and development work. Then I'll speak for 45 minutes, starting at about 9.45. This will be the technical um, portion of the program, where I will tell you uh, what the goals of the program are, why we're doing it, um, and what the current program design looks like. Everything that is in this program overview is going to be in the draft BAA that should come out tomorrow, hopefully. So. Um, don't feel that you need to write down everything, like feverishly write down everything that you see in this talk, because all of that is going to be released uh, publicly. Also, these slides that we're presenting here today will be posted on the program website, I believe. Um, after a short break, we'll be back at 11, and someone from our acquisition team will be talking about the, the nuts and bolts of how you actually do business with IARPA. As I mentioned, there are something like 12 startup companies in the room today, and I doubt many of them have had a contractual relationship with IARPA uh, before. So it's really important that we all get on the same page about what those um, relationships look like and how they're managed, what the expectations are for reporting, et cetera. We'll have a question and answer session from 11.20 to 12. Um, I'm open to this running a little bit over if there are a lot of questions, but uh, not too much over. Um, and then in the afternoon, starting at 1.30, we'll be back in this room for about an hour of offerers capabilities briefings. Um, the government all have to get lost after the morning sessions. I'm not allowed to be in the room. Um, when you are all talking about your capabilities and what you're looking for. So um, this is really your opportunity to, to network with each other. I can't facilitate that. Um, and then after 2.30, we have the room immediately next door. If you go out these doors to the right, there are a couple of poster boards set up for those of you who have volunteered to present posters and then lots of tables. So this is set aside for general networking, teaming activities. Um, so hopefully that will be value building for all of you. With that, I would like to introduce IARPA's chief scientist, Dr. Bill Vanderland, who will provide an overview of IARPA. All right, thank you, David. So we like to give an overview of IARPA <clears throat> at these proposer days because oftentimes people come in and think, IARPA, what the heck is that? So our name sounds like DARPA and it rhymes with DARPA and in fact we were uh, uh, created sort of in the image of DARPA uh, but with a different target audience. Instead of DARPA supporting the Department of Defense, <clears throat> IARPA supports the 16 agencies that comprise the intelligence community. So as you'll see, we do a lot of different things for a lot of different people. A very, very diverse set of technologies that we look at. But what we do is high risk, high payoff research, or to be precise, you do it. <laughs> we just give you the money to do it. We are a funding agency. We do absolutely no research in house. Uh, but the problems are very complex. Uh, what we're doing is trying to solve some sort of a hard problem that our mission partners have 
And in order to do that, we'll try and boil it down to some sort of really uh, complex technical issue. And if we can answer that technical issue, uh, then we've knocked down the risk on it and we can transition it to our partners to develop into a, a full system. So we do this by full and open competition, hence the BAA process and the proposers day that you are here for today. Uh, and we are what, what we call a program manager centric organization. Uh, our program managers are given full authority to run the program. We will not do a program unless we have a world-class program manager here to run that. Uh, so Dr. David Markowitz is the man. He has full authority for this program. If you have questions about it, you talk to him. You will see that we have a very heavy emphasis on, on metrics and measurement. Traditionally, it's been very hard to measure the progress of research, but we think it's doable, and we put a lot of emphasis on that. You will see that we have a great deal of um, support to the program from what we call a test and evaluation partner. So they will be, if, if you are selected for award, they'll be grading you as you go along on your results. Uh, we sometimes spend as much as 25 or 30% of the program budget on test and evaluation. Uh, so our partners are very important to us. We bring them in at the very start. They help us formulate the program so that it is going to be meeting their needs. And we will not do a program unless we see a clear path forward to transitioning it to one of those 16 uh, government agencies. So these are typically three to five year programs. And we do encourage you as much as possible uh, to publish your data in the peer reviewed literature. Uh, most of what we do is in fact unclassified. So our research, uh, we, for our convenience, we divide it into four thrust areas. The first that I'll talk about is is analysis. So this is essentially big data. We're drowning in huge, enormous amounts of data. Making sense of it is very difficult. Uh, the majority of these analysis programs involve machine learning in one fashion or another. Uh, we have a lot of effort in things related to image analysis, uh, video analysis, language, but also looking at other, a variety of other sorts of large data sets. Uh, we do what's called anticipatory intelligence. So this is everything from uh, you know, S&T intelligence where we're forecasting, we're, we're assessing where technology is going, in some cases looking at things like publications and patents. But there's a variety of indicators that we can use for that. Uh, we're looking at indicators and warnings of things that are of interest in the intelligence field, uh, giving us early warning of a variety of crisis, disease outbreaks, threats, and so forth. And we also do uh, geopolitical forecasting. We've been uh, in the forefront of developing things like prediction markets, as well as using machine learning for these. Uh, types of forecasting. Collection covers a very wide range of things. Uh, for us, it's everything from geolocation of radio frequency signals to unconventional polygraphs. Uh, we're very interested in synthetic bio biology, things like CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, we do a lot with biometrics uh, and with chemical and, and explosive detection. Basically, anything that's of interest uh, to our partners in collecting information, we will see where there's a sort of a niche for us to uh, push the technology forward. And finally, uh, our focus today is going to be in the computing area. So we are looking at areas where we can get revolutionary improvements in computing power. Uh, we're one of the lead agencies in the US government for funding quantum computing. Uh, we also support cryogenic computing, meaning uh, Joyce and Junction technology at four degrees Kelvin. And then also uh, neuromorphic computing, which is uh, sort of where David has his expertise and we'll be talking about uh, biological related and biologically inspired components. Uh, 
we do a lot of effort on, on uh, supply chain assurance, specifically for microelectronics, and we also have some efforts in uh, cybersecurity. So there's a variety of different ways to engage with us. Uh, periodically, we'll do RFIs. That's a request for information and workshops. And I believe there was a molecular information science workshop that David led in cooperation with SRC. Was that about 18 months ago? Or 2016. Uh, so that's sort of your anticipatory intelligence in a sense. If you see us doing a bunch of RFIs and workshops in the area, it's a pretty good predictor that uh, we are intending to launch a program. We also do what are called seedlings. These are small projects, typically a year or less in length, uh, which is intended to uh, explore a new area, uh, some sort of very high risk uh, thing, which might lead into a, a new project eventually. Uh, one of my colleagues used to refer to this as taking an idea from disbelief to doubt. Uh, so we do have a, <clears throat> a BEA that's actually open all the time a sort of a rolling admission process. You can uh, submit proposals. We encourage you to actually submit abstracts first or just call up one of our program managers and see if there's some interest. That is a way that is always open uh, for you to engage with us. Uh, we do prize challenges. Uh, started doing this a few years ago. Found it was very productive to say, put out a $50,000 prize challenge. And in, in some cases, we've gotten better results from that $50,000 prize challenge uh, than we had spending a million dollars with one of our T&E partners. Now bear in mind, it requires a pretty significant amount of effort on our part to launch a prize challenge. So it's, it's not just the money, it's the effort also. But what it allows us to do is to leverage um, people who would never ever sign a FAR-based contract with the US government. Uh, for example, we recently completed a prize challenge uh, called Morgoth's Crown. And this had to do with analyzing the spectra, chemical spectra of hazardous substances. Uh, but there's a lot of machine learning that was involved in this. And it turns out the top five finishers were all European grad students, individual grad students, not, not by their faculty members, <clears throat> in computer science and math who were specialists in machine learning, who knew nothing whatsoever about chemistry. The, the chemists who tried to address this all ended up near the bottom. So that gives you some idea of, of the power of machine learning, unsupervised machine learning. Uh, but yeah, all five of them were, <clears throat> as I said, foreign grad students. Three were actually from Russia, people who would never be submitting to a, a FAR-based proposal. And then finally, we have the uh, full research programs, uh, which last three to five years, and that's what we're here to do today. So that, I think I finished early. Happy to take questions if you'd like, but otherwise we can just move on. You can get to the good stuff. All right, then let's go ahead. This is great because it's going to allow me to um, take up more than my allotted time for the, the meat and potatoes of the technical presentation, which I think is, uh, is probably what we all want. So, okay, so um, once again, I am David Markowitz. I'm the program manager for the Molecular Information Storage Program, or MIST. Um, this will be the technical uh, portion of the government presentation when I go through the, uh, the background, the motivation, uh, and the design of the MIST program. Um, I should note uh, at the outset that we are um, videotaping uh, this briefing and it will be posted on IARPA's YouTube page uh, after the fact. Only the government portion of today's event will be videotaped. So if any of you want to go back and re-review uh, what we've said, you can get that there. These slides will be posted online. Um, okay. So. Uh, a couple of key things at the outset. This is going to be a multi-year research and development program. It's slated for uh, 48 months, or four years. Um, the, the program seeks to develop deployable storage technologies that can eventually, not within this, the timeline of this program, but eventually, they offer a clear path to scalability into the exabyte 
regime and beyond with substantially reduced footprint, power, and cost requirements relative to conventional storage technologies. And we seek to accomplish this using sequence-controlled polymers as a data storage medium and by building the necessary devices and information systems to interface with this medium. Um, I should emphasize we are not just looking for a proof of concept here. We're looking to develop devices that offer a clear and plausible path to commercialization beyond the, the scope of this program. And that's why it's so gratifying to have such great industry participation in the event today. I think it shows that many of you are thinking about uh, this as critically as we are. So we're specifically seeking technologies to optimize the writing and reading of information to and from polymer media at scale and to support the random access of information from polymer media archives at scale. Sounds easy, right? All right, so why are we doing this? Um, probably the first uh, third of my talk is going to be just setting up why this is necessary and why this approach is appropriate. So the scale and complexity of the world's big data problems are increasing rapidly. And use cases that require storage and random access from exabytes of mostly unstructured data are quite well established in the private sector, particularly in the internet space, and are of increasing relevance to the public sector. But meeting these requirements poses extraordinary logistical and financial challenges. To stand up an exabyte scale data center today requires the construction of a very large data warehouse, potentially covering hundreds of thousands of square feet, consumes 100 megawatts of power or more, costs billions of dollars over its lifetime to build, operate, and maintain. And a, a canonical, canonical example of this is uh, this cold storage data center that was stood up, I think, very early last year or late 2016 by a, um, a, a major internet company in Fort Worth, Texas. This is for archival storage and retrieval only. I don't believe this is used for analytics. Um, and based upon media reports, uh, this occupies uh, on the order of a million square feet of space. They had to build a 200 megawatt wind farm to support it. It definitely requires at least 100 megawatts of power. Um, the media lifetime, the, you know, the lifetime of the media they're using, which is repurposed Blu-ray media, is on the order of five years and requires re continual replacement and integrity checking. And over 10 years, the total cost of ownership is on the order of a billion dollars. So this doesn't offer a tractable path to scaling beyond the exabyte regime in the future. When we are faced with exponential data growth, and this is a, a quantifiably like, imminent problem, large data consumers are going to face a choice between investing exponentially more resources in data storage or discarding an exponentially increasing fraction of data really an impossible choice. So there are many requirements, uh, there are many factors that drive the resource requirements of large scale storage systems today, but perhaps the biggest factor is media. All conventional storage paradigms, whether they are magnetic, optical, or solid state, uh, write bit features onto planar media. And once the aerial storage density has been maximized in 2D, these paradigms offer limited ability to write bits isotropically in 3D. Solid state media is a the possible exception to that, although there are scalability limitations uh, even to that. I'll show an example in a moment. So as a result of this limitation, if you want to build a data center with exponentially larger capacity than a single unit of planar storage media, it requires purchasing exponentially more media and read-write hardware. And that's what drives the physical footprint, the cooling, power, and cost requirements. So if we were to reimagine large-scale storage from first principles in a way that uh, addressed these problems, what, what would be on our wish list for next-generation storage media? Well, first and foremost, uh, any next-generation storage medium should have orders of magnitude higher volumetric information density than con conventional uh, paradigms. In principle, this should enable the development of technologies that can scale with a substantially smaller footprint, and then by extension, lower power and cost requirements of the associated read and write hardware than current systems. The second item on our wish list is that uh, the next generation storage media should offer long-term stability against progressive data degradation 
to obviate the need for regular integrity checks and media replacement, which are major drivers of the operational and maintenance costs of today's data centers. And finally, as a practical matter, anything that we begin investing in today, there should already be basic methods in existence for writing and reading information from the storage medium um, that have been demonstrated. And the engineering optimizations that are needed to support real-world commercial deployment within a 10-year horizon should be clear and plausible. Now that last item of the wish list uh, throws out many potentially promising options just because the, the read-write technologies are, uh, have yet to be demonstrated or reproduced. So the opportunity space that we are attacking through the MIST program is to use sequence-controlled polymers as um, the next generation data storage medium. So polymers, you can think of them as molecular scale sequences of physical bits. Um, DNA use, is uh, biology's own long-term data storage medium. Um, so I'm showing here the volumetric information density of a variety of conventional storage paradigms in relation to uh, DNA. So it's been shown that DNA has a stable lifetime of minimally hundreds of years under um, less than ideal circumstances. Um, and an information density that's many orders of magnitude higher than conventional storage media. So this makes polymers attractive as a data storage medium. Uh, we are not limiting ourselves to DNA as a storage medium on this program. As I'll talk about in a moment, that is something that has been used for convenience in previous research, but synthetic polymers uh, offer a very attractive path uh, to the development of novel storage devices as well. To give you some insight into why the volumetric information density of polymers can be so much higher than that of conventional storage media, here I'm showing um, an example of uh, the bit feature sizes in NAND flash. So here is a stack of 3D NAND, which has 19 nanometer bit features in 64 stacked layers. I think we're up into the hundreds of layers at this point on the future roadmap. But the key thing here is that if you look at the bit feature sizes in DNA in relation to those of flash, um, the, the nucleotides in DNA are on the order of a nanometer, and the spacing between them is sub-nanometer. And that compares with 19 nanometers for um, something that has been nanofabricated uh, out of silicon. So this, is, this helps to understand why, and then you know, DNA is compressible within a volume as well. So that's, that's why these numbers for the you know, maximum volumetric information density are so much higher. Here's an example uh, that was provided by um, Luis uh, Cezé from the University of Washington, uh, who has done a lot of foundational work in developing operating systems um, for use with molecular storage media. This just illustrates the process of going from a sequence of bits to um, a sequence of uh, bases that you want to encode as DNA. You can then use synthesis technologies to like, physically instantiate that sequence as an oligonucleotide, uh, store this, preserve it, uh, either do bulk sequencing using uh, conventional life sciences technologies. Uh, there are opportunities for random access through hybridization reactions. Um, but you can read back the sequence and then use a decoding algorithm to recover your original uh, binary sequence. So this is just an illustration of how one could use DNA as the physical media in a, in a mist system. There's also been recent work um, by synthetic chemists uh, such as uh, Jean-Francois Lutz from Strasbourg showing how you can even use commodity polymers to digitally encode sequences as well. Potentially you could then sequence the, read those back using mass spec and that has been demonstrated. So I mentioned there's been foundational work on, uh, this is a very busy slide, but uh, there's been foundational work developing encoding schemes and uh, random access schemes using DNA as the substrate. These are just a couple of uh, illustrations of how others have employed uh, Huffman codes, XOR encoding, um, various addressing schemes, uh, various uh, error correction schemes on the bottom. So there is a, there's a lot of background work that has already been done thinking through the logistics of how you can 
uh, write information to DNA in a way that is findable and decodable in an error-free manner. And this is the type of uh, foundation on which we are going to build through uh, technical area three in this program, which I'll talk about in a moment. Just to give you some historical context for this program, um, we've been doing community building activities uh, for the better part of the last two years. Uh, IARPA and collaborators at the Semiconductor Research Corporation, Victor Zhernov is in the room today, uh, have organized a couple of workshops since uh, 2016 that have assembled international stakeholders from academia and the biotech, semiconductor, and information technology industries to roadmap clear and achievable engineering optimizations that would be necessary to develop scalable MIST systems. In the version of the slides that will be released on IARPA's website, we'll have a link to the roadmap from the 2016 workshop, um, so you can all familiarize yourselves with that if you're curious. The key is that this program seeks to put that roadmap into practice by assembling multidisciplinary communities around the shared goal of developing compact and scalable molecular information storage technologies to support real world big data use cases that are relevant to um, IARPA and its transition partners and the, the broader US government ecosystem. The vision for this program, right, it's my job as the program manager to project a vision for where we're going to take a new set of technologies. So the end result of this program will be technologies that jointly support storage and retrieval in an end-to-end -end fashion at the terabyte scale, okay? At the end of four years, we will have a practically deployable system that works at the terabyte scale. But this should offer a clear and commercially viable path, meaning with, with attractive economics, to future deployment at the exabyte scale. And that's part of the reason why um, it was so important to have uh, device manufacturers, you know, storage device manufacturers in the room today, investors in the room today, because we want to help lay the groundwork for um, deployment beyond the scope of this program. So the ultimate vision uh, for what we would like to achieve within a 10-year time frame is to go from the, the sort of behemoth of a cold storage data center that you have to spend a billion dollars on today to something that fits on a tabletop, analogous to the very first spinning disk hard drives that were commercialized, right? Something that sits on a tabletop, that consumes orders of magnitude less power, um, that uh, has a media lifetime that doesn't require frequent integrity checks or a replacement ever, right? And that might have a 10 year total cost of ownership in the millions of dollars range or tens of millions of dollars range as opposed to the billions of dollars, despite the fact that you are storing an exabyte. There are major challenges we're going to have to address to get here. I mean, just uh, maintaining high IOPS in the face of, of an exabyte scale device is, is a huge challenge. Um, but that is you know, emblematic of the sorts of challenges that we are going to address on this program. What are some example approaches that we uh, believe uh, will be necessary for this program to succeed? Well, we're looking for innovative solutions um, across a diversity of domains. Right, including chemistry, molecular biology, microfluidics, semiconductor engineering, and computer science. A subset of those no doubt resonate with each of you in this room. For me, certainly a subset of them resonates with me and my own background. I would be very surprised if there's even one person in the room who feels like they are an expert in all of the relevant areas for the success of this program. And that's why teaming is going to be so vitally important uh, for, for success. Some example approaches to writing data to polymer media include, but are not limited to, performing massively parallel chemical synthesis of polymers on microfabricated chips. That's just one example. Um, so chosen because that is what is used for uh, commercial synthetic biology applications today. Example approaches to reading might include, but are not limited to, sequencing polymers using arrays of nanopore sensors. Right? Um, there are other approaches one might take involving mass spectrometry, high throughput mass spec. Um, and it, it is for you to tell us what you think the appropriate approaches are. It is not my intention to be prescriptive here. All right? um, 
So some example approaches to uh, tailoring random access to the data in a Polymer archive might include, but are not limited to, using key value stores in conjunction with some physical compartmentalization of molecular media by data type to make it easier to find things that you're looking for. And that's chosen just because that's what's been demonstrated in previous work. Again, it's for you to tell us what you think is an optimal uh, scheme for organizing data and randomly accessing it. So what's the current state of MIST technology as I see it? Um, to date, most work in this space has focused on developing proof of concept encoding and decoding schemes for use with DNA storage media. DNA has been used purely for convenience because we understand it well and it provide, biology already provides tools for working with it. Really, they've been, people who have worked in this space have piggybacked on the achievements of the Human Genome Project use those technologies um, to make it easier to synthesize and read out sequences using these novel encoding and decoding schemes. There are many kinds of alternative media such as peptides or synthetic polymers that offer potential advantages over DNA, right, such as expanded alphabets that, and, and higher um, information density per unit volume. But the tools have been comparatively immature, and I think that's why most of the foundational work in this field has used DNA. None of these alternative media are out of scope for this program, and uh, we are very interested in hearing your creative ideas for how you might use other kinds of polymers that have, may have more attractive properties than DNA as the basis for novel storage devices. So many studies have shown that DNA uh, can support scalable random access, and error-free information storage. And I'm pointing to just a couple of recent publications uh, that illustrate that here. So um, based on this work, it's entirely plausible that you could use any type of synthetic polymer to achieve the same ends. But there are two major categories of technical challenges that remain for developing deployable storage devices. Um, these two categories are physical media and the operating system. So on the physical media side, we need fundamental improvements in the cost, the speed, and the scale of polymer synthesis and sequencing technologies. And I'll go into some more depth about that in subsequent slides. On the operating system side, we need scalable uh, approaches to indexing, random access, and although that's not within the scope of this program, ideally massively parallel search capabilities. Um, Many people who have attended the workshops that uh, we've organized over the last few years have counseled that there is no operating system that anybody has demonstrated uh, that plausibly achieves uh, these goals into the exabyte scale. And so it's very important to, to push on these goals in parallel with developing the devices around the physical medium. So, uh, Related to these physical media challenges of improving the cost, the speed, and the scale of the synthesis and sequencing technologies, the key challenge for this program, insofar as some of you might use DNA as storage media, is improving these performance measurements beyond the needs of the life sciences industry by several orders of magnitude. Life sciences applications require perfect synthesis and sequencing. If I synthesize a gene that has 5% errors, it is not compatible with life. Uh, if I synthesis, if I uh, sequence a gene that, in a way that is errorful, that is going to make my you know, genome-wide association study kind of useless and uh, not statistically meaningful. So the development of um, synthesis and sequencing technologies for the life sciences space have focused on perfection and things like scale, throughput, and cost have been secondary design considerations to just perfection. By contrast, data storage applications can tolerate pretty high read and write error rates. And um, under that constraint, scale, speed, and cost become primary design considerations. Just to give you uh, a little bit deeper insight, into what current synthesis and sequencing technologies can do and what the economics look like and how that relates to what we would need to make, um, to allow for practical uh, molecular storage. Let's say that we wanted to write, uh, just as a thought problem, let's say we wanted to write a terabyte per day 
uh, to DNA at a cost of $1,000 or less, and then read it back just as quickly. So you can take numbers from one of the more recent uh, coding papers for DNA storage, and back out, there are a lot of numbers here, and I, I apologize, but um, you can back out exactly what the cost per base would need to be using this encoding scheme uh, in order to achieve this goal I've articulated. And it, it's about 10 to the minus 10th dollar per base, and you would need a read uh, synthesis and sequencing speed of about 10 to the seventh bytes per second. So how does that compare with current storage technologies? Uh, it's current um, life sciences technologies. So the, as of about a year ago, the true cost of uh, polymer synthesis, these are, I think, colloquially called Carlson curves because they're produced by uh, Rob Carlson, um, to track the, the, the pricing and the throughput of uh, synthesis and sequencing technologies over time, and they are immensely useful uh, for genomics uh, applications and also, as it turns out, for scoping our needs for molecular storage as well. So the true cost today of um, DNA synthesis is on the order of, what is that, uh, 10 to the minus sixth uh, dollar per base. That factors in uh, a lot of overhead for um, the production operation. These are commercial prices. Um, but our goal of 10 to the minus 10th dollar per base is still four orders of magnitude off. And again, this is the cost for perfect synthesis, right? Um, on the throughput side, this is what has been communicated to me as roughly the, the current uh, read and, um, excuse me, the, the current read speed for sequencing technologies and what we need to achieve this, um, uh, this information retrieval goal of one terabyte in a day is also multiple orders of magnitude off. So these are historical data for life sciences technologies that ensure no errors. Um, I've been assured by many parties that the, the cost and speed goals that we're articulating here for storage applications are achievable through optimizations, particularly if we're willing to tolerate some errors, which we are. Um, but this is the explicit connection with the life sciences industry, and now we're going to go off in, a, in our own direction, right, and build our own devices for this purpose. Just to give you a sense for um, what the current workflow looks like if I want to encode information, write it to molecular media, read it back, and then decode it, this is a process that takes weeks, right? So this is a workflow from I mean, I think it was from a 2016 paper uh, from the Mo University of Washington Microsoft collaboration, where uh, once you know the, the oligo sequences that you want to synthesize, it can take weeks from order to receipt of the synthesized DNA. It's very costly, um, even if you buy in bulk. Uh, once you know what you want to pull out of, the, uh, of your molecular archive, if you want to do random access, it can still take days uh, to weeks to get the primers that you want and then to, to pull the information out of the archive. So um, this just highlights that to make this practical for real world storage applications, we need to deploy synthesis and sequencing te technologies together in a fully automated end-to-end -end workflow that allow us to do practically useful things within a day rather than making us wait weeks. Um, some other practical challenges on the workflow slide, uh, side are, uh, like this again is a workflow from this 2016 paper that I was just talking about. Uh, let's say that you had a library of molecular media. Um, so in that particular paper, the, this was organized into uh, millimeter scale vials containing DNA in solution. And the act of pulling information out of the archive requires physically pulling out a vial, uh, pipetting the DNA out of it, and, and running it through a sequencer. If I wanted to scale this up to the exabyte regime, it would still fill a room of this size, because the, by using such large vials and requiring a manual like a, the, um, retrieval process, um, it, you're, you're sacrificing a lot on the information density side. So this just highlights that if we want a storage system that plausibly scales to the exabyte regime 
and fits on a tabletop, it's going to require miniaturization and automa uh, automation. All right. The manual workflows that have been instrumental in establishing this field right, and demonstrating that it's even possible to use polymer media for storage applications, we have to dispense with those and start thinking about miniaturization and aut automation. Um, some of the physical media challenges, um, so I'm going to be talking about the specifics of the program design in a few slides, but I just want to meditate on these challenges now because they are very important and I want to make sure that everybody in the room uh, has an opportunity to think about them as you formulate your questions for me later in the morning. Um, to develop practical MIST devices, we really need to optimize all of these performance characteristics uh, together in the context of an end-to-end -end workflow. It doesn't it's minimally useful to have a device that can write data to Polymer Media if it takes forever for me to read it back out, right? So we really need to think about how to develop encoding schemes and physical organization schemes and um, uh, storage and retrieval approaches that seamlessly work together in an end-to-end -end workflow. Some challenges that are related to system integration might include fluidics automation, uh, establishing reliable interfaces between electronics and wet system components. You, there will be a lot of reagents and um, a lot of electronics in these devices. And this is a relatively, um, I don't want to say it's a relatively immature field, but we shouldn't take it for granted that there aren't fundamental R&D problems that we will need to solve in order to make uh, this, this application possible. Some challenges related to parallelization might include scaling down print heads or reducing uh, feature sizes to reduce uh, the volume of reagents that are required for storage or manipulation of media. We're going to be doing things at the nanometer scale on this program, and that is hard. Um, one key challenge that we are going to have to grapple with in this program is this um, uh, the readout challenge of non-destructive, the desire for non-destructive readout, ideally, versus the need to regenerate data after reading. If every time we read something out, we have to write it back to the archive to make it useful, um, that places a lot more burden on uh, us improving synthesis technologies, which, as you saw in my earlier slide with the, um, you know, the pricing curves over time, very much lag sequencing technologies uh, in terms of their pricing and their throughput, right? So th there's a, the long pole in the tent for phase one of this program is getting polymer synthesis closer to parity with sequencing approaches and the cost and throughput size. So um, in an ideal world, we'd be able to read out information without destroying the polymers in the process. But that may not be feasible for generation one devices. This is something that I would like you all to give careful thought to and then tell us what you think the best approaches are. But this has implications for whether you can use these devices purely for bulk storage and retrieval or whether you could also hope to use them for analytics as well, which require a lot more reading. So on the operating system side, um, I've been counseled that it's a major challenge to create scalable indexing, random access, and ultimately search capabilities. Um, in, in the operating system. Some, some fundamental questions that we're going to have to solve in this program. How do we index an exabyte of data in a way that supports fast random access? This is not a solved problem. Uh, if we are given support for random access from physical media, what addressing scheme is optimal um, to make that efficient? Does the need to optimize for random access suggest an optimal physical layout of the media? For example, would it help to physically group media by data type or file size, things like that? Um, th as I mentioned before, this is not within the scope of this program, uh, doing pattern matching and search on the media itself. Uh, but if you have a medium that, in principle, could support it, like DNA, uh, what encoding is optimal for supporting that, right? So some people have suggested ideas where the addresses um, that are baked into your oligos actually encode information about the content uh, of the oligo itself. So maybe you could do pattern matching in address space. I don't know. 
These are, this is a nice to have for this program, um, which I'm open to supporting, but it's not a hard requirement that we're gonna put in the BAA. There are other things that are very important to uh, uh, the government and industry, like how do you dynamically manage security policies it, in the limit of data that you don't wanna have to totally resynthesize every time you, you change a security policy, right? Um, and many of these, um, the solutions to many of these problems are going to be determined by the expected access patterns, right? Archival storage, where reads are uncommon, that will substantially be the focus of this program, archival storage, versus analytics, where reads are common. As we'll see in a moment, uh, some of the metrics for the retrieval technical area, which is TA2, are uh, trying to optimize it so that in the future we have a better shot at using this technology for analytics applications. So we're going after higher throughput sequencing than synthesis, um, but for what we're hoping to demonstrate on this program, it's gonna be largely bulk storage and retrieval. Okay, so what are the technical areas for the MIST program? There will be three of them. Um, and the reason why I compartmentalized things in this way is Everyone in this room is basically best of breed in some area, whether it's synthesis or sequencing or operating system development. Um, we want to make it as easy as possible for, for anybody to contribute value to this program. So if you have uh, polymer synthesis capabilities, but maybe you don't have any background in sequencing or operating system development, there's a technical area for you. Um, Networking and team building are still going to be important uh, for uh, being, I think, being a credible offerer to any of these TAs because we're still fundamentally concerned with building devices and um, it's really important that you fill out all the necessary capabilities uh, on your team if you're going to propose. So technical area one is for storage. The goal of this TA is to develop a tabletop device capable of writing information to molecular media with a target throughput and resource utilization budget. And I'll be more quantitative about those uh, requirements in, in a couple of slides. There are a lot of approaches that one could take in this technical area. You could use DNA, polypeptides, synthetic polymers, or any other kind of sequence controlled polymer medium. Technical area two is uh, for the development of retrieval devices. And the goal here is to develop a tabletop device capable of randomly accessing information from molecular media with a target throughput and resource utilization budget, which will be spec specified in a few slides. There are a variety of approaches one could take to this technical area. These include using nanopores, mass spectrometry, or other methods for sequencing polymers in a high throughput manner. And finally, technical area three is operating system development. So the goal here is to develop an OS <coughs> for use with storage and retrieval devices being developed by these other two technical areas um, in a way that coordinates indexing, addressing, data compression, encoding, error correction, and decoding of files from molecular media um, and, and in a way that supports efficient random access at scale. This is um, for all of the prog progress that we've seen on the operating system side in the research community over the last few years, this is probably an area where there is the need for the most fundamental research and development work. And the, um, the metrics for this TA are a little bit more open-ended, as you'll see in a moment. All right, so um, we strongly encourage collaborative efforts and teaming among potential performers. Teams are going to be multidisciplinary, uh, very likely, so they're for any of these technical areas, you are very likely to see teams that have expertise in chemistry, molecular biology, microfluidics, semiconductor engineering, and computer science. Uh, you can propose to any combination of one or more TAs. You can propose to TA1 only. You can propose to TA1 and TA2. You can propose to TA2 and TA3, or all three. It's up to you but you should plan to be part of an integrated team comprising all three technical areas. If you only propose to TA1, the government will pair you with TA2 and TA3 performers that have compatible approaches. What is out of scope for this program? 
Approaches that rely on media other than sequence controlled polymers for long term data storage are out of scope. We're going to employ a test and evaluation team to assist us in evaluating progress and the success of the program. There are a number of um, parties in the room that represent our um, probable T&E partners, and I would encourage you to engage with them and learn about their expertise um, while you're here today. Um, I think it's mostly from the National <coughs> Laboratory System. So uh, the T&E team is going to measure each performer's device and operating system performance against a set of metrics and milestones that are specific to each technical area. And we'll go through those metrics and milestones in a moment. As you will see in the draft BAA that we're going to release hopefully tomorrow, uh, we are going to ask you to propose a test and evaluation methodology that's compatible with your proposed technical approach. I don't want to presume that I or our t and &E partners know the best way to evaluate your devices. We think we have a pretty good idea, but um, this is a collaborative undertaking, so please tell us what you think is the right approach. Okay, this program is going to have two phases. Phase one will seek to develop storage and retrieval devices and an operating system with performance that's suitable for gigabyte scale applications. This will be 24 months long. Um, in TA1 and TA2, the, the fundamental objective of phase one is to de-risk scalable synthesis and sequencing approaches for data storage applications. I mentioned that improving the metrics of um, DNA synthesis is like the long pole in the tent if you were to use DNA. So we expect there's a lot of fundamental innovation that will need to be demonstrated in those TAs. In technical area three, which is the operating system, um, we're going to ask performers to develop a simulator of the hardware being developed by TA1 and TA2, guided by the anticipated uh, performance characteristics of those devices, um, and that captures some anticipated failure modes of those devices. And then we're going to ask you to demonstrate an operating system that supports indexing, addressing, and random access uh, at scale on top of that simulated hardware. This is a fairly well-established technique in the storage industry for emerging uh, data storage hardware, and we are embracing that here. So key decision points during phase one. Um, in month 12 uh, of the program, TA1 is going to have to do deliver a decodable polymer data archive to the government. So what that means is, um, uh, at 9 a.m. on a Monday morning, we will send you some files, and at 9 a.m. on Tuesday morning, you give us a bag of polymers. Or, uh, you know, in, in, in a more, um, in a manner that's more aligned with the goals of the program, maybe you give us a, uh, a chip that has an array of polymers structured on it. You know, that's to be determined. And we will then sequence that and determine if uh, we are able to decode the files that we gave you the day prior. Uh, in month 23, which is just before the end of phase one, both technical area one and two will have to demonstrate functional devices uh, with specific requirements that I'll talk about in a moment. And TA3 will have to demonstrate an operating system uh, that functions as desired, running on top of simulated hardware. So there's this explicit decoupling of the operating system TA from the device development TAs in phase one. And that's a deliberate choice to help accelerate progress in these two areas without requiring too much coordination too soon. So the output of all this should be a fully automated order 10 gigabyte per day workflow that can scale after further optimizations in phase two. During phase two, the goal will be to optimize the devices and the operating system to support terabyte scale applications. And this will be performed over 24 months. Key decision points there are a year into phase two, which would be at month 36 of the program. All technical areas will deliver devices and an operating system that work together uh, to support uh, on the order of 100 gigabyte per day workflows. And then at the end of the program, uh, these should support terabyte per day workflows. 
So how are we going to do test and evaluation? This will happen a few times during each phase, roughly once per year. Performers are going to be evaluated on several metrics, which I'll talk about uh, starting in the next slide. And these metrics will become progressively more challenging from phase one to phase two. All right. There is a lot of information in this slide, which I just realized may not be legible to those of you in the back. But rest assured, this is lifted directly from the draft technical BAA that will be released. So you can go and read this table tomorrow, hopefully. Um, these are some example metrics and milestones for technical area one. They include things like the resource budget for storage. As I mentioned earlier, we'd like to be able to synthesize a terabyte uh, of data to Polymer Media in a day for $1,000 or less. Right? So this just articulates um, you know, the, the goal for phase one, which would be to do 10 gigabytes for uh, the equivalent of $1,000 uh, or less. And then phase two, it'll be a terabyte. Um, there are many ways of doing this evaluation. I, we don't anticipate that you're going to actually have to write 10 gigabytes in a day. We can extrapolate this from a uh, smaller demonstration. Maybe you do 100 megabytes, and then we look at your, the volume of reagents that you use and the power envelope and things like that. And we can extrapolate what the effective cost and uh, daily write throughput is to see if you hit this target. So we're flexible on that. Um, in terms of the write throughput, I already mentioned we want to be able to do a certain amount of data uh, written to a Polymer Media Archive in a day. This can be uh, extrapolated from a demonstration involving less data uh, in less time. So maybe you do like 100 megabytes in an hour or something like that. Um, there are opportunities for you to specify additional metrics uh, that you think are important for us to evaluate as you develop these devices, things like maximum volumetric information density. So I had alluded earlier to having these um, uh, archives that, are, that consist of millimeter scale vials organized in a grid, right? That has a high local volumetric information density, but a low global volumetric information density. So uh, if you want to define a metric that allows us to um, evaluate that in the aggregate, you know, we're happy to do that. Other things like write error rate are probably important. How we expect to, um, and let me just check my time, 10.18, so I'm good until 10.30. So that actually works out perfectly. All right. Um, how do we expect to do test and evaluation in TA1? So our T&E partners may require physical access to the devices that you are uh, producing and the ability to instrument them with sensors if we want to validate the volume of reagents that are used, for example. Um, to assess the overall performance, I think minimally we're going to want to look at uh, the inputs and outputs from these devices. So let's say that you're a TA1 performer uh, task with writing a certain amount of information to a polymer in a day. We give you a file and we take the polymer media archive that you generate and sequence it. And that's a pretty unambiguous measure of whether you have written what you were supposed to write within a certain amount of time. We don't need to get into the guts of your device in order to say if you've done a good job in that regard. Um, it is still to be determined what the digital collection of files that we will ask you to store Will, uh, will be comprised of. We're looking for, it's most likely going to be a mixture of both structured and unstructured data, including things like text documents, uh, spreadsheets, server logs, multimedia, and with file sizes that range from kilobytes to megabytes, from the very small to very large. There's a diverse group of government stakeholders that we're, whose needs we're looking to meet through this program. And so we want to be able to evaluate the compatibility of these uh, approaches with, with a wide variety of use cases. OK, for technical area two, uh, I had already mentioned that we're going to be optimizing some of these metrics for future analytics applications. And that's why um, these are essentially the same metrics that I just described for TA1, which is the, the resource budget for retrieval and then the read throughput. You'll notice here, though, that we're looking to, in phase one, to read the equivalent of a terabyte per day in phase one. And the reason why we're going for uh, that more ambitious goal is we want to lay the groundwork for analytics applications in the future. 
under the assumption that we have um, read methods that are non-destructive and might allow for repeated reading, uh, we would like to have particularly high throughput read capabilities to support analytics. So the likely methodology for TA2 is uh, very similar to what I just described for TA1. We're gonna very likely require physical access to your devices to instrument them with sensors. Um, we're going to evaluate the devices at the level of their inputs and outputs. So for a ret retrieval device, it's anticipated the government will give you a polymer media archive where you have told us in advance what properties it should have for compatibility with your device. Uh, and then 24 hours later, you email us some files, right? And tell us what you read out with your retrieval device. And that will be, since we know what we put into the Polymer Media Archive, it's, it's pretty easy to check uh, whether you have uh, decoded the information properly. Um, so I already mentioned that you're gonna have to specify the requirements concerning things like the, the polymer chemical composition that goes into the retrieval devices, uh, any assumptions regarding the addressing and encoding scheme that's used, copy number, physical organization, et cetera. Um, this is not going to be as trivial as we give you a bag of polymers and you just have to deal with it, right? This will be very carefully planned in advance. All right, so I mentioned that technical area three is gonna be a little bit more open-ended because this is where a lot of fundamental research and development work is required. These are just a couple of um, example metrics and milestones for T and E, for TA3, the operating system technical area, that we might pursue. These are things like the resource requirements uh, for the simulated storage and retrieval hardware. You should not require a supercomputer to simulate uh, storage and retrieval hardware. We're not, I don't think that doing molecular dynamic simulations uh, at the, you know, at the level of billions of polymers is the sweet spot for developing these simulators, right? You're gonna have to make some simplifying assumptions and um, for the sake of making this be, have tractable resource requirements. Uh, resource requirements for uh, different components of your storage and retrieval workflow, right? So it's been uh, communicated uh, very clearly to the government that uh, encoding is cheap and decoding can be very expensive, right? So what are the resource requirements for uh, encoding information uh, in preparation to write it to Polymer Media? What are the resource requirements for decoding information uh, once you get uh, you know, base calls off of your sequencing hardware, for example. Other things like the precision and recall of random access operations or other metrics, we're totally open to doing that. This is a conversation that uh, we're starting today with the community. So please, in your, in your questions, in your written feedback to the program BAA, uh, to the program um, email address, uh, give us your thoughts, and in particular in your feedback on the draft BAA. Um, so our likely methodology for, uh, for T&E, for this technical area, um, we will take custody of your simulators and we will introduce failure modes. We will perturb the, uh, the performance of the simulated hardware and then study the robustness of operating systems uh, to different failure modes of the hardware. Um, by the end of phase two, we're going to evaluate the operating systems directly interfaced with the physical storage and retrieval hardware. So we'll have to develop methods for doing that as well. And the composition of the files uh, that we're gonna ask you to work with are roughly gonna be consistent with um, what I've already described for the other TAs. Okay, in summary, and I'm right on time. This is so unusual. Uh, we're looking for a diversity of approaches to developing deployable storage technologies that can eventually scale into the exabyte regime and beyond with reduced physical footprint, power, and cost requirements relative to conventional storage technologies. We anticipate teams will include individuals with a broad diversity of expertise. This program is about building bridges between disciplines that historically might not uh, have collaborated closely together. So we're, we're offering that incentive for you all to, to work together. 
We expect teams will have a strong plan for working across team members to accomplish program goals. From running another uh, program at IARPA that is inherently multidisciplinary and has a big team-based component, I have learned that you really cannot take it for granted that people are going to work effectively together uh, in the absence of very clearly delineated roles and responsibilities and who has to deliver what to whom on the team and when. So please review this brief. It'll be posted to the website after the meeting today. Um, please review the draft BAA, which should be posted tomorrow, and any other materials on the MIST program website. Send us your recommendations and suggestions for the BAA. Um, using the prescribed format. So in the BAA that will be released, there is a table and we ask that you structure your feedback within that format. So please conform to that. Another disclaimer, the BAA will supersede anything that's presented or said at this proposer's day by IARPA. So here, finally, is my contact information. Um, I try to be very responsive, uh, so you should all feel free to reach out. Um, once a BAA is released, I think that I have to be very careful about giving privileged information to any one party, so all answers to questions will be posted publicly on the website rather than directly through email. Okay, uh, thank you all very much. Please write down your questions uh, on the note cards that were provided. Um, I'd like to thank our wonderful events team also uh, for making this event go off without a hitch today. Uh, so the, the next thing on the agenda, we're going to have a 30-minute break until 11 o'clock, and then uh, our acquisitions team will give a, a brief on how to do business with IARPA, and then we will we'll do the question and answer phase. So thank you all very much, and I'll see you back in uh, 30 minutes. Good morning. My name's Katie Cole. I'm the Chief Acquisition Officer for IARPA. Um, I know that you're all primarily here to hear about the technical content of the MIST program, but we always like to take the opportunity just to kind of review what you can expect when the solicitation comes out. So I'm just going to spend the next 15 minutes or so walking you through that. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them at the end. So FBO.gov is where we'll publish our um, BAA. When that comes out, we obviously recommend that you read the entire BAA before submitting questions. Pay attention to section four. That's gonna give you all of your instructions and submission information. We um, use a system called IDEAS that we'll get into a little bit later, but that's where all um, proposals will be submitted. In addition to the BAA, under the IARPA.gov website, up in the top right-hand corner is the Frequently Asked Questions link. We recommend that you go and hit that up as well if there's any question that you have that the BAA didn't answer. There's a lot of information there. If the FAQs don't, for whatever reason, answer your question, you, the BAA will contain our BAA email address. All questions can come into there and then we'll respond. We ask that you write them as clearly as possible and that you don't include any company proprietary information in any of those questions, please. Okay. So eligible applicants, one of the reasons that we do these proposers days is that we really do encourage collaborative efforts and teaming arrangements. Obviously you'll spend a lot of the afternoon kind of um, with the opportunity to get into that. but. Um, that's the responsibility of the proposers to come up with teaming arrangements and collaboration. The government will not um, take part in that, encourage that, provide any instruction related to that outside of providing you an independent opportunity to collaborate. Foreign organizations and individuals may participate. They need to comply with the NDAs, security regulations, export control laws, et cetera, that are identified in the BAA and that apply to everyone else that's um, taking part. So there are some organizations that we consider to be ineligible. Again, under the IARPA.gov website, you'll find our organizational conflict of interest policy that'll spell this out in detail. But essentially, there are some privileged organizations that um, have access to government information that makes them ineligible to submit a proposal. So that's gonna include FFRDCs, UARCs, and other government agencies. 
For intellectual property, unless otherwise requested, the government um, will take unlimited rights. Now, at a minimum, for anything that's proposed, we ask for government purpose rights for, the de for any data that's being developed using mixed funding. At the time that you're submitting your proposal, there'll be instructions in there as to what you need to do to clarify any rights restrictions that you're um, requesting as part of the submission. So, and then if you're selected, obviously, for negotiations, we'll work through all of that with the contracting officer to get the terms and conditions of the contract in there correctly. So pre-publication, IARPA um, most certainly encourages that information resolving, resulting from the research that we're doing is published and you know that that's all unclassified. So prior to release of that work though, there will be some sort of review of that information from the program manager. That's all spelled out in the contract and a lot of that's up to the program manager to determine how they would like to do that. So they'll decide if they want to do an approval before release or receive a courtesy copy X number of days prior to release. And again, all of that will be spelled out um, in greater detail at a later date. It's part of the BAA. And then questions can obviously be answered during negotiations as required. So preparing for the proposal, again, go into section four, make sure you understand what that's saying for proposal instructions. It'll provide you the link to IARPA's um, proposal ingest system ideas. We encourage that you go ahead and enroll into that system a couple days prior to the due date, just to make sure that you don't have any issues or um, concerns as far as getting enrolled in that system. It's relatively easy. On that system, there's a help desk link that provides you email as well as um, telephone if there's any concerns or issues arising. It is up to the offer to make sure that their final version of those proposals is obviously loaded before the due date. If you have classified information that you would like to submit in conjunction with your proposal, there'll be instructions in the BAA on how to contact the Chief of Security at IARPA, and we'll work through that with you. So um, again, we encourage that, FB, that you go to FBO, because that's where we're going to post any updates. For example, after the BA is released and we go through the question and answer section, we respond to questions. Um, they'll be posted to FBO. You'll also find a link on the IARPA website, but that it, the onus is on you to kind of be tracking that. And then finally, under section five of the BAA, we'll outline the evaluation criteria that we're gonna use to evaluate every proposal. So the proposal is evaluated not against other proposals, but against the, um, the evaluation criteria established in section five. So um, we alluded to this earlier, but in preparing for the proposal, please go and review our OCI policy. Um, this, again, it'll walk through the restrictions for FFRDCs, UARCs, and OGAs, or other government agencies. If, um, if you think that there's a conflict, right, if, there, if you're not sure about something, you're gonna, there'll be instructions in the BAA how to contact IARPA and work through all of that. Um, another situation that we see, like sometimes there's a perceived conflict if um, we have CETA support. So if, you, if a company is providing CETA support into IARPA as well as trying to bid, there are certain things and protocols that you need to follow in order to notify the government prior to submitting a proposal so that we can flush those out and determine, make a determination if you can or cannot submit. So all of those instructions will be outlined in the BAA. And this just kind of gives you um, some additional information on that. But again, the director, anytime that those are coming in, we will work to respond very quickly to those to um, walk through all of that with you. But what you're going to do is you're going to provide all the information that you have available to kind of walk through what you think the issue is, and we'll help you determine if there is one or if there isn't one and what needs to be done about it. So for streamlining the award process, again, in the proposal, we're going to be very clear on what we're asking for, and that's all we want. <laughs> So we don't need anything in addition, specifically with the cost proposal, just re respond to the requirements that are requested. We don't need anything, uh, any additional detail at this time. Um, in order to do a cost reimbursable contract with the government, you need to have an approved counting system, which essentially means that a cognizant government auditor has gone through your system and approved it. Now I realize there are some folks in the audience where that might not apply, and that does not limit or preclude you from submitting a proposal to, 
in response to this BAA. We can use other forms of contracting in order to establish a contract with you, so please don't let that stand in your way of applying. As part of your response, there'll be a statement of work that's included, that's kind of outlining the work that you're gonna do. Just be aware that um, if selected for negotiations, there might be some reformatting of that or clarifications to you know, outline deliverables, et cetera. Um, if you're gonna identify key personnel, so key personnel, there's an expectation of the person as well as the time that's going to be provided by that person. Um, you know, you'll identify what those percentages are, but um, in general, 10% is not key, right? I mean, there needs to be some substantive effort and focus on this program from your key personnel, and we would anticipate seeing that in the proposal response. And as you're working on your collaboration and partnerships, we do understand that there's sensitivities in the type of information that a subcontractor will or will not provide to a prime. So there'll be some basic cost information that most certainly can come into a prime, but we understand those restrictions. If selected for negotiation, we will then work to get the details from the subcontractors. So as far as IARPA funding, we fund applied research for the IC. There's always questions that kind of come up about export control, ITAR, ear regulations. So what you're gonna do with any of those concerns is you're gonna go to your business office, your grants office, and they will walk you through how to resolve any um, concerns and make sure that you feel okay, but we don't resolve those for you. So finally, as a disclaimer, um, the final BAA is what you're responding to. Today is provided to give you some information about the program to kind of provide the broad outline. Based on feedback from you today, things might be revised within that BAA, but you're gonna use that final BAA published to FBO for the requirements to what you're gonna respond. Nothing from today, okay? So are there any questions that I can answer for you? I guess I did a pretty good job. <laughs> so um, I'll go over a few of the ones that typically come up. Um, as far as budget, yes, this program has a budget. No, we're not going to share that with you. Um, we don't have a predetermined number of awards. We will be looking at the proposals that come in in correlation to what's provided in Section 5 of the BAA to make a determination on who we're going to select. A typical question. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you all very much. I'll be around afterwards if there's anything else you'd like to go over, something pops up. Thank you. So I'd say that about a third of the questions that were given to me on note cards were how much money is the government giving out, <laughs> how much will the individual awards be, so uh, Katie nipped that one in the bud. Um, so I'm going to go through the written questions. We also have a uh, microphone here. You should feel free to um, ask questions. Uh, anything that might come up during this discussion, I want to make sure that everybody leaves here as informed as possible about the current plan. Okay, so this one is, what's the overall budget? No. What is the size of the grants? Uh, they will be appropriate for uh, the work that is proposed. Um, do you require company match? No. Um, although uh, it is always nice to, I mean, co-funding agreements are in scope, right? Yeah, the BAL will address that. Yeah. Uh, what is the IP policy? Uh, Katie addressed the, the fundamentals of that, that the government retains government purpose rights. Everything else is negotiable, I believe. What's the anticipated budget? Um, matching contributions, just talked about that. Are there seedling programs in the DNA store data storage space? Because we are doing a full program, in this area now, which tends to have a substantially larger budget than individual seedlings. I do not currently have plans to fund seedlings in this space. That could change, but that is the current plan. Um, that said, uh, you are free to submit seedling proposals 
and address them to specific PMs at, at any time. Um, so I don't want to discourage you from submitting you know, proposals for things that you think are aligned with the needs of the intelligence community. Uh, I just think that uh, this program is addressing that need right now and um, it might obviate the near-term need for seedlings. If a team develops technologies for both TA1 and TA2, it is conceivable that IARPA would not be able to create the material slash media necessary for t &E for either TA1 or TA2. How would this be handled? Thank you very much for addressing this question. So uh, it has been um, communicated to me that there are a couple of parties, and I've known about this over the last year at least, there are a couple of organizations that are developing integrated write and read devices where it's not trivial to just pull the media out and, and for the government to look at it. And so the draft BAA that should be released tomorrow specifically addresses this point and says if you are proposing to develop a device that is integrated in this way, um, propose your own test and evaluation approach. Right? How can we instrument your device that still allows us to assess your performance? If we can't pull the media out or if your read device isn't compatible with us synthesizing our own media and giving it to you, um, what is an appropriate approach? So um, we are inclined to be flexible to accommodate all approaches that can help us achieve the goals of the program. Um, this one has text that goes up the side. So can you provide more information on pairing between the different technical areas? Specifically, what will the government do if teams are missing components in their proposal? Um, so I mentioned, like, you are all best of breed in some uh, way. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is to help facilitate teaming activities so that if you are looking to propose within a TA, you can um, fill out your team with the requisite expertise. So we have the ability to pair you across technical areas. If you propose to TA1 and there is a TA2 performer that you've never met before that has a perfectly compatible approach, like we can team you up. But um, the government isn't in a position to fill out your team within a technical area. So let's say you have a novel synthesis chemistry. Right, um, we can't hook you up with people who can help you design devices to put that into practice. That's, um, you know, that burden, unfortunately, is, is on you. Um, all we can do is try and provide these opportunities for you to, to network with the right people to help. Uh, hopefully that addresses the question. But if you propose to one technical area and are funded in that TA, the government will provide relevant partners for you in the other TAs. Uh, by forming teams, does this restrict a TA3 OS participant from moving between teams where perhaps a TA1 slash TA2 approach is demonstrating a much better result? So I think the, my interpretation of this question is if we pair a TA3 performer with a TA1, TA2 um, pair that doesn't achieve the desired progress toward program goals on the schedule, is are all members of that team at risk. And there are ways of engineering the teaming so that one TA3 performer could conceivably contribute to multiple parallel TA1, TA2 teams, as long as they have approaches that are compatible with the particular operating system that you're developing. So this particular design of the program is intended to afford us that flexibility, and we will see what proposals we get, what is fundable, and what makes the most sense. But the short answer to that question is we have, we have flexibility so that um, a TA3 performer would not necessarily uh, be at risk of a down select if their partners aren't upholding you know, their promises for various reasons. OK. I should say contractual obligations, not promises. Uh, OK, question. Seedling prize programs for DNA-based storage tech. Uh, I already addressed the seedling issue, prize programs. I don't currently have plans to do a prize challenge in this space, but if you think that that would be value building for the community, 
let's say, in, in the operating system domain? Should we be organizing regular workshops, right? Should we have a community that we are cultivating in, in the TA3 area? Should we be doing prize challenges? I'm open to all of these things. So please give us your feedback on what you think would be most value building for the program. Error rate goals for the MIST program. Um, you will notice that those were conspicuously absent from my slides. Um, that was because I was counseled by a number of information theorists uh, not to be overly prescriptive about what error rates should be. So I said that we can tolerate non-zero error rates. All I care about is that we can write and read back information in a way that uh, has no loss. So, um, How do you deal with confidentiality during phases one and two? So I appreciate that given that the long-term goal of this program is to produce technologies that are com commercially deployable in the long term, there are IP considerations and there are confidentiality considerations. And um, although uh, I believe the, you know, all of the reviewers of proposals that we receive have to sign uh, non-disclosure agreements and financial, uh, you know, information disclosures to make sure that they're not conflicted, uh, and we have to keep anything that is source selection sensitive confidential. Um, the the terms of your uh, what you disclose to partners on a team, or in public uh, to uh, the program at large during our workshops. We have technical exchange meetings and, and other events where we bring people together. I think that that's all negotiable. Uh, during contract negotiations. Is that correct, Katie? Yeah. yeah. So again, we're sensitive to these concerns and we will work with you. Um, it's not ideal if we have to have uh, like a kickoff meeting where each team only presents to the government and none of the other teams are allowed in the room. Uh, but if that's the only way that we can make this program happen, then, then you know, that's a possibility. Is the 1K budget, the $1,000 budget, identical for reading? Um, for archival applications, it may be more reasonable to require readback of a small percentage of the data encoded. Um, so I tried to emphasize in my talk that, in the technical presentation, that that's like an effective uh, cost and throughput target of $1,000 for writing a terabyte in a day. Uh, we may require you, we may allow you to write and read smaller volumes of data, and then we extrapolate the cost uh, and the throughput from that. Um, so yes, the $1,000 budget, uh, is, we are unlikely in contracts and in, in your deliverables to define that target in terms of a dollar value, because it's kind of arbitrary. How, I mean, you could buy all of the world's um, uh, reagents that are needed for phosphoramidite synthesis of DNA, and then sort of the, uh, the the cost of the marginal cost of synthesizing a small amount from that bulk volume that you've bought is like zero. So, have you synthesized DNA for like zero dollars in that situation? I think probably a better way to measure the cost of synthesis is in terms of the volume of reagents that you use and the power that's required to power the devices, things like that. So $1,000 is really just a proxy for these other estimates. Um, but the short answer to the question of um, are, are we looking for the same budget for reading and writing? Um, no, I think we actually have more aggressive budget targets for reading than we do for writing. I highlighted in my slides we're looking for uh, reading a terabyte in a day for $1,000 or less at the end of phase one. And for, for TA1, we're looking to synthesize 10 gigabytes a day for the same resource requirements. Hopefully I addressed your question, but please come up to the microphone if, if you need clarification. Um, how do you anticipate producing polymers for t &E, given that each approach will differ likely dramatically? This is true, and um, we are going to need to do a lot of planning on the government side to make sure that we are able to synthesize polymers that are appropriate for the, the performers that we fund. That's going to require, and we have a, at least a year-long lead time during phase one, and even more lead time during the pre-phase when we're doing contract negotiations. 
uh, to prepare for that. So um, we are aware of this issue and we will we'll roll with it. If we make both a TA1 and TA3 proposal, would the government make pairing suggestions for a different TA1 team? Are they suggestions or requirements? So uh, you are encouraged to propose to all the technical areas where you think you could credibly perform. Um, if the government decides to select your team for uh, one TA but not another that was in your proposal, then it would be entirely uh, up to the, the negotiating process during contract negotiations to determine who your partners would be and what your obligations would be uh, in other TAs. So um, you are free to say during contract negotiations, either you fund all of our proposal or you fund none of it, but it could be ultimately to your disadvantage to do so. Um, but again, we're looking to work with you in partnership uh, to uh, maximize our chances of achieving the overall program goals. And it, it doesn't do anybody um, any good to be inflexible while we're sorting out exactly how these teams are going to be structured. So I'm committed to being flexible and accommodating as long as you are as well. Your timeline is aggressive. That's the idea. Uh, it takes three to six months to hire people and buy capital equipment. Understood. What is the time from uh, contract approval to contract start date? I should note that a number of these use the word grant. A number of these questions use the word grant. So this one said, what's the time from grant approval to grant start date? These are not grants. These are contracts with deliverables and a statement of work. Uh, and the government um, reserves the right to halt work on a contract if there is not satisfactory progress toward the contract deliverables on the schedule that we have defined. So just so we're all on the same page about expectations of accountability, um, these are not grants, these will be contracts. I believe that we have uh, some flexibility in the types of awards that we make. We can do other transactions um, and there are other types of you know, exotic contracts that we can do, and Katie is the person to speak with about that. But we do not anticipate awarding grants through this program, I believe. Um, but what is the time from contract approval to contract start date? Do you want to address that, Katie? 